Erica here with Prep Scholar GRE. Here today with an online lesson, GRE Geometry 101. If you like this video, subscribe for more great content and check us out at gre.prepscholar.com to learn more about what Prep Scholar GRE can do for you. Now, while there's no way to know exactly how many geometry questions you'll see on test day, an estimated 15% of quant questions are geometry focused. That's a significant amount. Of all the subjects on GRE Quant, geometry can be the most work for the least reward. Like all other GRE Quant questions, geometry questions aren't really testing math. They're using math to test more important concepts, such as critical thinking, working with limited information, testing assumptions, etc. However, you won't get a chance to demonstrate your ability in these important skills if you don't know the math being used to test them. For geometry, that math is memorization heavy more so than any other type of quant question on the test. A single question may utilize a variety of formulas and rules, from triangles to circles to quadrilaterals to lines and angles, and missing even one step in a multi-step problem can prevent you from answering the question. Now, all of that said, there are ways we can make the most of these challenging problems, both in our study and in our approach to the problems themselves. The first thing to know is that while there are many rules and formulas to memorize, many can be lumped together for easier memorization. We'll go through five of the most helpful sets of rules here. First, we can find the area of any quadrilateral by multiplying the length of the base times the length of the height. This is also commonly expressed as length times width. So squares, rectangles, parallelograms, trapezoids, all of them length times width. Now, for shapes with two different bases, like trapezoids, we need to find the average of the bases and then multiply by height. But the same general rule holds true. Second, if a three-dimensional solid has the same diameter throughout, so in other words, it has the same shape on top as on bottom, the volume formula will be the area of the base times the height of the solid. So for any solid based on a quadrilateral, like a rectangular prism or a cube, the volume will be the length of the quadrilateral times the width of the quadrilateral times the height of the prism. For a cylinder, the volume will be pi times the length of the circle's radius squared times the height of the cylinder. For a triangular prism, the volume will be one half the length of the triangle's base times the height of the triangle times the height of the prism itself. Now note, this will not work for shapes with inconsistent diameters, such as cones or pyramids. Uh, a quick aside, for the most part, the distinction between length, width, height, base, etc. doesn't matter at all. We can call whichever side whatever we want, so long as we apply the formulas correctly. For instance, I could call this the length, this the width, and this the height, but I could also call this the length, this the width, and this the height. Third, rather than memorizing the sum of the interior ang angles for each polygon, Simply know that we can find it if we take the number of sides the shape has, subtract 2, and multiply the result by 180. So a triangle has three sides. Subtracting 2 gives us 1. Multiplying by 180 gives us a total of 180 degrees for the sum of a triangle's interior angles. For a quadrilateral, we have four sides. Subtracting 2 gives us 2. Multiplying by 180 gives us a total of 360 degrees for the sum of a quadrilateral's interior angles. Now, this is particularly useful once we get into more shapes with more sides, where we're less likely to have these numbers memorized, such as octahedrons and nonahedrons, which can appear on test day. Fourth, for circles, interior angle, arc length, and sector area can all be thought of as the same fraction of the whole. For example, if an interior angle is 60 degrees, that's one-sixth of the total 360 degrees in a circle. This means that the arc length formed by that same interior angle will be one-sixth of the total circumference of the circle. This also means that the sector area formed by this angle will be one-sixth of the total area of the circle. So no need for any formulas, just logic and ratios you can build out live on test day. Fifth there is no need to memorize both the distance formula and the Pythagorean theorem. They're the same thing. We can find the distance of a line with the coordinates of two points on that line, x1 and y1, and x2 and y2, by taking the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus x1 squared. But why does that work? 
Well, when we take x2 minus x1, we find the horizontal component of our line. When we take y2 minus y1, we find the vertical component of our line. Drawing out these horizontal and vertical components gives us a right triangle. If we square both sides to get rid of the square root, we end up with a formula that tells us if we square both legs of our right triangle and add them together, we get the length of the hypotenuse squared, which is exactly what the Pythagorean theorem tells us. Once again, if we understand the concepts behind what we're doing, we save time on memorizing yet another equation. Now, if there's one thing you do want to invest the time in on memorizing, it's our triangle rules and formulas. Triangles are the most commonly tested shape on the GRE, so it's worthwhile to be really comfortable with them. Similarly, like we saw with the distance formula, pretty much everything on the GRE can be simplified down to triangles. Have a diagonal line, turn it into a right triangle. Don't remember the formula for a parallelogram or trapezoid, turn it into a rectangle and two right triangles. Weird shape, divide it up into either right or equilateral triangles. This means that knowing your triangles inside and out can help you even on problems that aren't explicitly triangle-based. Which leads us to how we can most effectively solve these problems. On most geometry problems, we aren't going to look at the problem and go, oh, I totally know how to solve this. First I do A, then B, then C, then D, then divide by E, and that's my answer. Now, for the most part, we're not going to know how exactly to solve until we're pretty close to the answer. This means that we need to be smart about how we approach the question. Now, a couple of tips on how to do this. First, write or draw what you know. If you get a diagram, draw it on your own paper. If you don't get a diagram, make one. Then, once you have your diagram, label everything you know from the question. Doing these problems in your head is a great way to get lost and overwhelmed. Make your life easier by putting it on paper. Also important, make sure to note what you're solving for. A classic trap on geometry is solving for the wrong thing. Make sure you don't fall into it by jotting down which length, which angle, which area, which ratio you're solving for. Second, simplify to what you know from your studies and label accordingly. Most GRE geometry diagrams aren't easy to decipher. The test maker isn't likely to give us something that we can easily work with. However, we can always take what we're given and break it down into things we do know, like triangles or sets of parallel and intersecting lines. Then, using what we know about that more manageable and recognizable chunk of the diagram, we can learn more about a different angle, a different line, a different shape, etc. Now remember, once we learn anything new, write or draw it on your diagram. Third, remember to go one step at a time. Once you learn a new piece of information, see what you can do with it. If you're stuck, see what information you haven't used yet. For every piece of information, ask, why did the question tell me this? What can I do with this information? To solve geometry questions, we don't need to know the full path to the answer. We just need to know the next possible step. Now, important note, as you're doing this, make sure you're only relying on things you know for a fact, not assumptions that you've made. For example, since GRE diagrams are not necessarily drawn to scale, it's important not to assume that two angles are the same just because they look like they are. If we aren't explicitly told that the angles are similar, we don't know that they are. They might be, we just don't know. Same with parallel lines, we need to be told. And that's our Geometry 101. To recap, geometry accounts for about 15% of quant problems. There are a lot of geometry rules and formulas but many can be lumped together for easier memorization. If we prioritize any content knowledge, it should be triangles. Approach the question wisely by drawing and labeling everything we know, simplifying the question down to concepts we can work with, and going one step at a time, making sure to consider each piece of information we have and avoiding assumptions. Thanks again for watching, and feel free to check us out at gre.prepscholar.com for more great GRE content. See you next time.